Macy's is committed to supporting college access and better student outcomes. Throughout May, join Macy's in celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI Heritage Month by supporting APIA scholars, whose mission is to equip AAPI young adults with the resources they need to succeed in higher education and beyond. Just round up your next in-store purchase or donate online to APIA scholars. Shop AAPI-owned products and learn more at Macy's.com slash purpose. Smoothie King asks, what's that sound? That's the sound of hearts popping out of your eyes when you see Smoothie King's all-new Smoothie Bowls. These power pack beauties are just waiting to be spooned. Our Smoothie Bowls start with acai or pitaya and are handcrafted with fresh toppings like sliced bananas, sweet berries, ripe mangoes, crunchy purely Elizabeth granola, and a savory peanut butter drizzle. Mmm, that's the sound of a smoothie bowl being made fresh, just for you. The new Smoothie Bowls menu, only at Smoothie King. Look, most people go into healthcare because they want to help people feel better. We don't like it when people are sad. And when you're anxious and you don't really like to do it, you avoid or you hedge or you do all these things that make the communication even worse. Welcome to How To. I'm Amanda Ripley. One sentence no one wants to hear is, I've got some bad news. Especially if you're sitting in a hospital waiting room, hoping, praying for a loved one to be all right. It's not easy to be the one delivering that bad news either. Here's Dr. Meredith explaining this on Grey's Anatomy. When you walk into a room to tell someone that their loved one has died, it's more than just a list of bullet points you've memorized. Yours is the face they will remember for the rest of their life. You are changing this person's life forever. You are responsible for this moment. And that one moment can lead to even more heartache and confusion if handled poorly. My name is Mara. I work as a social worker at a level one trauma center. And Mara, how long have you been there? Oh my gosh, six and a half years. How often do you have to deliver serious news? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I would say it's nearly daily, sometimes okay. multiple times a day. Now you might be thinking, isn't that the doctor's job? Well, yes, doctors do deliver a lot of serious medical information, and we'll get to that. But it's also Mara's job to track down the next of kin and let them know that something is wrong. It's just automatically disturbing for me to call up and be like, hi, I'm calling from the mm. hospital. Mm. I'm trying to reach the family of so-and-so. I think everybody's pretty much horrified by that type of message. It often sends people into a panic, understandably. For example, the other day, Mara was helping a young woman who'd come into the hospital with a gunshot wound. The woman was desperate to have someone reach her brother, but police had taken her phone, which often happens in cases like this, and she didn't have her brother's phone number memorized. So Mara needed to track down the brother. He was immediately, like, started driving and was like, what happened? You know, wants to know, like, exactly what happened. Well, telling somebody the details, like, oh, they were shot while you're behind the wheel of, like, a moving vehicle isn't, you know, ideal. I was like, are you able to pull over? Are you able to stop the car? Um, and then he was like, no, I'm good, like a, I'm like five minutes away. I just want to get there. So then I started going through, you know, okay, yeah, she's going to be okay. Let's like give you the information about the parking garage and how to get in here and what the floor is going to be. Holding back further details of what happened was smart until the brother got into a more controlled setting. But once he got to the hospital, Mara ultimately had to break the news. Your sister, I'm really, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but um, she was actually shot. He had a very, like, flat affect. I've had, obviously, like, gunshot wounds are, um, you know, that's, we have a fair amount of that at the hospital where I work. People can respond in a variety of ways, oftentimes, like, extreme emotional reaction where they can no longer speak, they can no longer, like, be on the phone, or they cannot take in information about, like, how to get where we're located. How do you feel about this part of your job? Okay, so I am a licensed clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. So I have a master's degree in social work, and then I did all this mental health care training. 
But that is not this, you know? I I would love to have some sort of sense of how to do this part of my job in a less traumatic way for people. Here's the thing. Eventually, all of us will have to deliver bad news, even if we don't work in an ER, whether we're a police officer or an HR rep or just a person on the planet. We're going to have to tell someone something that changes everything. And at some point in time, all of us will be on the receiving end of that same conversation. So how can we make these gut-wrenching encounters go less horribly? It turns out there's a fascinating body of research on how to communicate grim news. And just about all of us can get a lot better at it once we know how. So today on the show, how to deliver bad news better. Mara will trade tips with a doctor who spent his career figuring this out and teaching it to other clinicians. Stay with us. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. So whether you love true crime or comedies, news or celebrity interviews, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you wanna pay for car insurance, and then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll wanna press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Creating visual content is an essential part of business, but the creative process isn't always easy. Like, oftentimes I'm trying to figure out what image to put on one of the newsletters I sent out or a website that I'm creating. But Canva for Teams makes it easy to collaborate and design with other people, which makes the whole process so much more creative and fun. I can talk to other people, I can communicate with them, and as a result, they can tell me how to make this stuff better. Canva for Teams is a design platform that makes it easy for anyone to create stunning content in any format, from social media posts to videos, presentations, websites. The endless templates and premium fonts and photos and graphics and videos, they all add this personality and edge to any team's content. Collaborate with Canva for Teams. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you go to canva.me slash howto. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash howto for a free 45-day extended trial. Canva.me slash howto. So if you've been listening to this show for a while, you probably know that I routinely have these existential crises about the state of journalism and how we could do it better. One thing I do to cope with these crises is to interview people in other fields to figure out how they do things, things journalists could maybe learn from, which is how I met Dr. Arnold. Oh my God, you should call me Bob. <laughs> I'm a palliative care physician at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. I also have worked with two other colleagues around the country to teach clinicians how to have uh, conversations with seriously ill patients. I interviewed one of your colleagues a while back and she called you the Yoda of having difficult conversations with patients. That's because I'm <laughs> old and getting <laughs> smaller, I think. <laughs> All jokes aside, it's actually because Bob is incredibly wise, which I witnessed firsthand when I got to sit in on one of his classes for intensive care physicians late last year. And one of his first lessons about how to break bad news, stop calling it bad news. The patients and families didn't like it. When we editorialize about the news, their view was, tell me the news, I'll determine whether it's bad or not. And so we, I've gone to using the term serious news, which means anything that 
changes your sense of what you expected the future to be Hmm. rather than bad news. One of the things Bob is unusually good at is teaching in such a way that he knows people are actually learning, which means they have to practice. So he had the doctors meet one by one with professional actors and role play these difficult conversations. And I got to tell you, it didn't go the way I expected. You know, you had these ICU doctors who had just, you know, lived and worked through a pandemic. And I was so struck by how nervous they got, knowing they were actors, knowing this wasn't real. Some of them just couldn't bring themselves to say the thing, you know, and or didn't know how to say it. It's hard when you're a clinician because you have all these medical facts in your head and you've been trained to spend all your time on the medical facts. And then you're in a high stakes conversation where the person is clearly anxious and may get really emotional. And you both need to keep the medical facts in your head and listen really carefully to them and be really clear about what you want to say. And you haven't done it very much. In other words, the skill set required to become a doctor is not the same as the skills you need to communicate heartbreaking news to humans. And by the way, it's not just doctors who struggle with this. I was being reminded of a scenario with one of my friends who had had a brain tumor that had been reoccurring over a period of probably eight years or so. There was her sending out sort of this message to a bunch of us that all went to college about sort of the update. Mm -hmm. And because of my experience, I could read between the lines and say, oh, this is going to be the end. And I remember reaching out to some friends of ours at the time and being like, we need to get out there. We need to go see her. And they were like, what are you talking about? We read the same letter. And I was like, oh, Mm. (laughs) no. So if you're trying to communicate serious news, you want to start by understanding what the other person already knows. My goal isn't to give information. My goal is that they hear and understand the information. Those are two different things. We know that they're more likely to hear it and understand it if it builds on what they already know. And I match their level of sort of jargon or medical lease language and to what they've already heard. And one of the ways to make it easier is if you, as a group, you and the other clinicians and the nurses and the social worker sit down and say, what do I really want this patient or family to know after the conversation? That's what we'll call a headline. And you write it down because what we know is that we hedge because we don't want people to be upset. And so... We all have a tendency to do that. We do that when we break up with people. We do that all the time in our normal lives. And so writing it down helps you be clearer to say the things that you really wanted to make sure that you were going to say. Bob is 100% right. Actually, this tip is kind of a through line that comes up a lot on this show. Difficult conversations deserve preparation. Writing things down shouldn't be seen as a crutch. Instead, it should be seen as a buoy when the emotional waters get choppy. And it's especially true in the medical field. Folks can get really caught up in speaking in great medical detail that even myself as a provider that's been in the hospital for whatever, many several years, will sit there and go, I have no idea what they just said. Mm. That's the biggest issue, I think, for families, especially the families that we serve. And they don't necessarily indicate that because it is this like, you know, hierarchical relationship where you're like, okay, listen to what the doctor says and don't question it. But there's times where you can tell that families like have do not understand. Mm. People don't want to look stupid in front of clinicians. So they won't ask the doctor. When the doctors leave, they may ask the nurse or social worker. And two, we give the medical information because that's what we do when we talk to each other. And so when we talk to a patient's family and at the end of giving really serious news, the family says, what does that mean? What it means is that we didn't do a good job. Because giving 
a headline means saying what's wrong and what does it mean for your loved one. Meaning is a core piece of it for the patient and the patient's family. And so that's what you have to, before you go in the room, you have to think about how do I, you know, at a fourth or fifth grade level, because average health literacy, how do I say it and how do I say what it means? Finally, if it's really serious information, the way that you know that it was heard is most of us, when we get really serious news that isn't what we expected or wanted, most of us respond emotionally. And so if the family doesn't get upset or give you any emotion, you have to wonder whether you said it in a way that they really heard it. So I think if I have this right, the way you teach this is to use the formulation, ask, tell, ask. So ask to get a sense of what they understand and what they want to know. And then tell, that's that headline, which is information and meaning, what it means for them or their loved one. And then ask again, right? Especially if you haven't gotten a clear emotional response. So I'll often get an emotional response and then we need to attend to the emotion because remember when people are emotional, they're not listening. Mm -hmm. And then everybody When you say, Bob, attend to the emotion, what does that sound like? You need to sort of... Be present with them and acknowledge what they're going through as one person with another person. I see. So prove that you're witnessing and aware of the pain. Yes. You know, Mm -hmm. I often will say, depending on the patient and the family, I often will say, this sucks. Oh, literally, those words, yeah. Or I wish I had better news because I do wish I had better news. Yeah, it's true. Mm Mm-hmm. Mara, what are some of the things you say to communicate that this sucks? This is really hard. I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, it's weird to say it again now in this context and not have like any emotion <laughs> behind those words. <laughs> right. I have witnessed people say things in a way that feels like detached from emotion or like empty, like, I'm sorry for your loss in this way that I'm like, I never want to say that to people with mm-hmm. where it doesn't feel authentic or genuine. The words matter some at the beginning. What really matters as you get more experienced is that they're genuine and authentic and you're present with them. Mm. Yeah. Bob, I'm curious, what does it look like when you get everything right? When it goes as well as it can go, you are really present with the family. I'm going to use family, although it could be patient. They hear the information. They feel like you're sitting with them and attending to them and have all the time in the world to answer their questions. They feel listened to and heard. I often will say to people, when you go home, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So tell me sort of what you're going to tell your family when you call them up tonight. It's the sort of second ask. Are they taking back what I wanted them to take back? They take it back. And I've done a good job to prepare them for the next step, whether the next step is another clinician coming in to seeing them later today, whether the next step is a decision to go forward with surgery. I've helped them begin to reintegrate what life looks like, given the serious news. That's the goal. But what if the family doesn't want to hear the serious news, like, at all. That's coming up after the break. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply. You know, if you're anything like me, one of the things that you learned during the pandemic was... 
It's really important to take some time and relax when you can. The last few years have taught us how important mental health is to our overall state of well-being. All of us feel stress and anxiety and sleep problems, so how do we deal with that? Well, that's all changed with Headspace. Headspace helps improve mental health through guided meditations, mindfulness practices, breathing and calming exercises, and so much more. I use Headspace to meditate. There's this nice person telling me what to visualize, and it makes it feel like it's supposed to feel. Headspace has helped more than 100 million people worldwide, and they can help you too. So listen up, because you don't want to miss this. For a limited time, all of you can try Headspace for free for 60 days by going to headspace.com slash how to 60. You will not find this offer anywhere else. Use the link H-E-A-D-S-P-A-C-E dot com slash how to 60 to unlock all of Headspace for free for 60 days. This is not something they normally do. Headspace.com slash how to 60. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply. We're back with Bob Arnold, a doctor who specializes in teaching clinicians how to deliver serious news and Mara, a medical social worker at a level one trauma hospital. I had a family one time who was like the ultimate, we don't want to hear bad news family, where a member of their family had been shot actually to the head and was not going to survive. And we were speaking with the mom. The conversation barely started. And then she just like got up and was like, I don't want to hear any more bad news. I'm done and wanted to leave the room. I was obviously there. And followed her, you know, because she was in crisis out into the hallway. And then we eventually took her up to the roof of the hospital where there was a garden. So she could just, like, get some air and try to explore, like, what's going on for her. But it was really rough because we couldn't even have the conversation of, like, how severe this was because she just got up and left. I'm like, how do you better respond to that? I let her go. I I say, oh, my God, this feels like it's really overwhelming. All these people trying to give you all this information. What would be helpful to you at this point? And you just said, she'll calm down. She already knows things suck. That's why she can't hear anymore. Right. You know, when I say to people, would you like to hear what, what I think? And they say, no. I asked. They answered. I'm done. I have one of my questions that I say to families is, I wonder if you can imagine, despite everything we're doing, if things don't go the way we want. And if Mm -hmm. they say, no, I can't imagine he's not going to get better. Okay. But there's nothing more for me to say at that point. I build a relationship for next time. Right. Hmm. Sometimes the family doesn't want to hear bad news, and yet we have to make decisions, right? Right. Those are harder. And then again, I'll just be transparent. I'll say, I know you don't want to hear anything worrisome. And yet I'm feeling stuck because I feel like we need to make some decisions. And so I'm not sure how to handle this Hmm. because I don't feel like I can ask you to make decisions without knowing what's going on. And then I shut up and let them tell me. Yeah. I actually really love that. Like, I would love if a doctor said to me, I don't know what to do. I feel stuck. I'm not sure how to handle this. I've never, (laughs) I never heard those words come from a doctor before. (laughs) Yeah, but, but part of it is, again, it's being genuine. People will ask me questions and the residents will say, what do you know if you don't know the answer? And I'll say, you know, the one thing I don't want to do is give you incorrect information. That's a great question. I need to ask some other people. I will come Mm -hmm. back to you. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid they may not trust me or respect me. That's 
I can't fix that. I can only give them genuine information. And my job is to get the information and then come back to them. And again, some of this is I'm very old. You have to practice it. You have to have a chance to debrief it with colleagues. You you know, for the first 15 years of my career, I had this amazing psychiatric nurse who I would audio tape myself with HIV positive patients, and mm. I would ask her to listen to the audio tapes. She would give me feedback about what mm. I could do better. Hmm. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you go into a patient and you say, I want to be better at communicating. Can I audio tape myself and have someone listen to it to tell me how I can be better? Patients are like thrilled that you want to get better. They all say yes. They're like, oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. No, I, I'm struck by how I've been interviewing people for 20 years. And until I started doing a podcast, no one ever listened to me interview and gave me feedback uh, because mm. I was a print journalist. But I wonder, Mara, do you get any feedback? You know, no, I haven't been recorded um, having conversations since I was probably in my second year of grad school. But yeah, it's been a decade yeah. since anyone gave me that level of feedback, um, which is kind of sad, <laughs> to be honest. No, I think <laughs> that's, that's, not that's great. the norm, right? In, in a lot of professions. Yeah. Um, but it shouldn't be. Yeah. Most of the people listening to this are not clinicians, but they will at some point have to sit down for a conversation like this. Someone is giving them bad news. Is there anything that you would suggest families or individuals kind of keep in mind or do to try to make that conversation more useful for them? Bring someone with you or say, can I tape record this so I can listen to it again later? There are some great apps out there in the world now that not only will let you tape record it, but it'll translate the medical jargon. Oh, really? Wow. Into, into normal, like, human language. Mm. And so I think first be kind to yourself if you don't remember it. And don't be embarrassed to ask the clinician or the nurse again the next day. You're mm. not expected to remember it. Say, I didn't really get it. Can you tell me again? Uh, yeah, that's true. It is hard to say that. It feels like Mara was saying it's very hierarchical often and you feel like at a power disadvantage and you feel not at your best. Mara, any, any advice that comes to mind for you? I always try to encourage families to be taking care of their physical needs like making sure to drink water. A lot of times people don't feel like eating after getting mm. horrible news or, you know, even the day I meet them, like, have you slept? Mm -hmm. Like, did you get any rest? Because that will impact folks' abilities to mm. take in information. Absolutely, yeah. If you're somebody who, whatever, runs, swims in any sort of regular way, like to try to continue to do that, even though your husband is in the hospital, like, mm. it's okay to come in an hour after the mm. start of visiting time because your regular routine is that you would be swimming or... Oh, that seems like a that really make sense? important thing to give them permission, right? To Because if you yeah. say that to me, I'm going to feel like, okay, it's okay. I can go take a walk. Right. The other things I would tell them to do are ask that a nurse or a social worker can be there because often they have more time and will be able to translate stuff after the doctor is done. Your job is to get the information that you need. In realizing that the clinicians may not have all the answers either and may not be able to give you the answers that you want, particularly if your loved one is really serious or if you're really mm -hmm. seriously ill. Yeah, I remember one of my favorite formulations that you taught those physicians was the words, I'm worried that, uh, because often there's uncertainty, right? Like you can't say right. if the person's going to live or die or how long they're going to live. And and so that becomes its, its own like kind of quagmire. But instead to say, I'm worried that your father will not recover and be able to do the same. He will not live the life he led before. I feel like I'm worried that is a really good way to start that sentence. Yeah, no, I think that's affirming. I will say that as a provider who's not a doctor, I started to have this feeling of if this happens, if when this happens to me, to my family, I'm going to think I want 
to hear you tell me the way that you're talking about it in the break room or in behind the scenes before you prepped for this meeting. What did you say? What was the blunt way that you spoke about this? Hmm. Because so many times before a family meeting, I'm understanding where they're, everyone's speaking bluntly about this person's not going to survive. Hmm. There's no path forward. And then we're in the meeting and all of a sudden I'm like, what are they talking about? This is so confusing. Oh, my God. I love that. And what I joke is doctors often when they're with families, they give the NPR story, <laughs> which is really, really long. And it doesn't have interpretation with it. And the family has to sort of impute. They have to sort of guess from the tone and what the clinicians are saying, what it means. And that feels unfair to me. Then the doctors get mad if the family doesn't understand it. And the family didn't understand it because we did a bad job. If the patient or the family said, can you please just say it the way you would have said it in the break room? <laughs> like, do you think that would work? No, they get wigged out because you're not supposed <laughs> to know that. You're not supposed to know we have a break room. <laughs> what I'll often say to families are some people like the big information. Some people like the sort of just the summary. Other people really need the doctors to be sort of optimistic. Help me understand how you most like information. Mm -hmm. I think that doctors are really worried because there are some patients, and we can't predict, who really don't want to hear serious news. And so everybody remembers the time where you did it and the family got really angry at you and nobody likes families to get angry or complain about you. And so we go from bad situations and we generalize. Mm -hmm. As a, One of the advantages of saying, tell me what you already know, is you can begin to get a sense of where that family is. Mm-hmm. And where they what they want to know, what level of like Mara wants a lot of detail if it's her loved one, you know. And no, Mara doesn't want a lot of detail. Mara <laughs> wants the bottom line. Ah, I see yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Mara <laughs> wants to know what it means. Mara doesn't want people to hedge. Yeah. What Mara knows is that she can sit in family meetings and she listens for the hedge words that tell her what the clinicians are really saying. Oh, what's like a hedge word? Really sick is often a hedge word because it's sort of like if your loved one is in the ICU, they're obviously really sick. Right. And so when they keep saying really sick, it's hard to tell what they mean. All right. This feels like a good moment to recap what we've learned so far. If you've got to communicate disturbing news, start by trying to figure out what the other person understands already and really listening when they tell you. Then... Give them the headline, the news plus the meaning. That's important. But don't wing it. Write this down in advance. You might be tempted to skip this step. Please don't. After that, you should see some emotion. Acknowledge it. And if you don't see it, try again. Remember, the goal is to make sure the person has understood the news, not just to make sure you've said it. It's striking to me how both of you are describing a conversation that requires the clinician releasing some grip on the control over the conversation, right? Which can feel scary. I remember you saying in that class, Bob, some, one of the difficult things that patients sometimes say is, I'm hoping for a miracle. I'm sure you've heard that one, right, Mara? Yes, a lot. Yes. Yes. Well, I remember Bob saying that you could just say, me too. God, a miracle would be great. I would love that. Yeah, I think sometimes for us, the miracle is has already happened. The miracle is that you're able to come hold this person's hand mm. at their bedside and that they are have not died in the street. Mm. You know, that that's the miracle that that we got to mm. have for you. And it's hard to say that to folks. Um but that's the real miracle that we're all working in, in that context of intensive care, is that 
they're able to lie here and you got to hold them and be with them now. I do have to say, and I think Mara would agree, that what I find more than anything else in having serious conversations with patients and families is the degree to which families and patients are resilient and they come together and they find meaning and love in very stressful times and that that feeds me as much as having difficult conversations might seem like it's draining. In general, I just see people doing the best they can in really hard times and sort of being resilient and loving and meaningful and powerful. I want to leave you with this last insight. Hope is inherently intertwined with delivering serious news. We doctors, journalists, people in general, often worry about giving people false hope. I actually asked Bob about this the last time I was with him, and I think it's a lovely place to end. He said, hope is a many splendored bird. When doctors say hope, they believe there's one kind of hope, which is to live longer. But many patients say they hope they're going to live longer and they hope they're not going to be in pain or they hope they're going to be able to go on vacation and on and on. We don't know people's hopes until we ask. We get in our way a lot. It's really hard to listen clearly and try to hear what the other person is saying rather than to filter through our own beliefs and emotions and preconceptions. It's how do you really give people frames and words to be able to really have genuine relationships with people and support them at times through things that are very new to them and are very hard for them to hear. We are deeply thankful to Mara and Bob for sitting down with us, despite the very long hours they're both working in hospitals right now. We'll put a link to Vital Talk, Bob's nonprofit, in the show notes if you want to learn more. And please share this episode with friends, because sooner or later, we'll all be here. So why not make hard conversations a little easier? And remember, we're always here for you with whatever difficult human problems you need help with. Send us a note at howto at slate.com or leave us a voicemail, 646-495-4001. And we'd love to have you on the show. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Rosemary Belson, Kevin Bendis, and Jabari Butler produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is our senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. Carvel Wallace is my co-host. I'm Amanda Ripley. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.